Right, so uh, I'm Kostis Kodnetis. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce James Beckett, um, a man who today lives in California where he's having uh, what we could call a second life as a documentary filmmaker, mostly of environmental or all environmental issues. But back in late 1967, as a young Harvard-trained lawyer, Beckett was sent alongside Anthony Moreco uh, by the then not very well-known uh, Amnesty International to document torture in uh, Hunter's Greece. It is impressive that Beckett and Moreco came up with no fewer than 18, I think, different forms of torture used in Greece at the time. Rates from Falanga, mentioned before by uh, Judge Sicilianos, to sexual torture, which are in fact extremely accurate to the actual practices used by the colonel's regime to inflict pain on its political opponents. Amnesty's report in Beckett's own book, Barbarism in Greece, catapulted torture to the top of the human um, rights agenda, to quote Barbara Keyes, and is very much at the root of today's conference, of course, and the Greek case in the Council of Europe, where he also testified. Of course, James was not alone in all this. His wife, Maria Beckett, uh, became a really prominent figure of the uh, Greek anti-dictatorship resistance, of who uh, James is also going to talk to us about. So um, let me just say on the structure that it's called conversation um, with James Beckett, but uh, James is going to talk, I think, about 25 minutes or so. I will then pose a couple of questions and we will I will open it up uh, for you to, to converse with him. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming James Beckett. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so, um, what am I doing? Uh, what's my story? We all have our stories. And uh, I will speak uh, this evening from my narrow personal experience of what it was uh, 50 years ago. Uh, when I read the scholarly articles that I wrote as a lawyer, uh, I have forgotten how complicated uh, the Greek case at so many levels uh, was. Uh, so I was uh, born in America when it was America's turn to be uh, the global empire. And it was an empire of noble principles and a lot of uh, bad behavior, uh, including their support for the Greek colonels and a policy to oppose any human rights efforts. When I graduated from college, my mother had organized a family grand tour of Europe. And the first stop was uh, Greece, where my parents had spent their honeymoon in 1932. We crossed the Atlantic on a Greek line ship. That is how long ago it was. Um, and there I met Maria. After a rather long and sufficiently dramatic courtship, uh, we were married, uh, and we had a, a, a child uh, when I was uh, in law school. Uh, Maria did not have a favorable view of Americans, despite her relationship with me. And me living in Greece was not realistic. Uh, so we decided on neutral Geneva, Switzerland. <laughs> um, I pursued more studies. Maria, who already had a PhD in Byzantine history, uh, studied Russian, and she was a busy mother with uh, two children. So we were leading normal, unremarkable lives, even banal, uh, changing diapers. Uh, so um, I think along comes April. 21st, uh, 1967, and I think our first response was to send a telegram of protest. And I, I have no idea, I don't remember where we sent it. Uh, so 
When the junta fell seven years ago, Maria and I rode out to the middle of Lake Geneva, and we had a very large black plastic bag, which we dumped into the bottom of Lake Geneva. This was before we had any concerns about the environment. Um, so, um, but the distance that we traveled over that seven years between a telegram and this black bag was wider than Lake Geneva. Um, in many ways, this, this is Maria's story. And it's a story of a woman who became an activist because of an unacceptable event that happened in her, the country that she loved, Greece. Um, so she, acting as an individual, she had no political ambitions, totally dedicated to the cause, incidentally in a world dominated by men. Uh, she was to play an historic role. Uh, and I can't resist just giving a few examples of when I say she played an historic role. Um, when the junta was collapsing, the question arose, who would, who would take power? And the CIA asked Maria, because of the political weight she had at the time, to come to Paris because they wanted her support to back their candidate. She refused and said she was backing Karaman Lees as the only person she felt could manage to bring the army back to the barracks. And that, of course, uh, proved, to be, proved to be the case. Um, not that she was a great fan of the former prime minister, but that was her sound political judgment. Karaman Lees later offered her to become the ambassador to the United States. And uh, I felt that was a fine idea, but uh, she didn't. Uh, so her, her job was done, let the Greeks get on with their democracy. Uh, another example was when the junta uh, overthrew the Cypriot president, Archbishop Makarios. Uh, we should not forget that the Cypriots paid the price of Greece's return to democracy. Uh, my two daughters are here at the moment, and they were in Kyrenia uh, when they looked out their hotel window, and there was the whole Turkish invasion fleet before them, and the bullets started to, started to whiz by. Uh, Maria was in Beirut at the time. And Arafat offered to send 4,000 PLO troops uh, to Cyprus if Makarios agreed. And what happened was that the, they bombed his palace, and Makarios just walked out of the palace. And he hitched a ride with a car that was driving by. And he ended up at the, the UN in, in London. Uh, sorry, in London, the UN in New York. Um, and uh, Maria, uh, she set up Radio Free Cyprus in Beirut out of the PLO uh, station. And I flew to New York to get uh, Makarios to tape something that she could play over the, over the radio. This, of course, nowadays you do it in nanoseconds. Um, so, Anyway, at this time, the Greeks were returning in triumph to Athens with the Karamanlis. And the Radio Free Cyprus could be heard in Athens. And I think it was Lambrius who heard. And there's Maria's voice saying, um, you know, the Cypriots paid the price of this, and you're returning in triumph. And Karamanlis, you didn't do anything. So Karamanlis was not pleased with this but he still did offer her the job later. So uh, back to April 21st. So the struggle facing the anti-junta forces was framed as restoring democracy in Greece. And we know how important framing is, and this was a very positive frame. 
um, that played on Greece as the birthplace of democracy. So the battle lines would be between democracy and human rights on the one side and Cold War anti-communism authoritarianism on the other side. So what were the fronts on which we too as individuals uh, could, could fight the good fight uh, without particular uh, resources? As a team, I could write English and Maria, as she always said, she knew her Greeks. So first off were the media who were generally favorable uh, to the cause of democracy. And then there was lobbying governments, parliaments, the American Congress, all the pro-democracy pro celebrities, etc. Then we have international organizations, the Council of Europe, and for us what would prove to be the most important was the Commission of Human Rights. Then there were NGOs like Amnesty International, International Commission of Jurists, and then sprouting up there were all these odd hoc groups, particularly in Europe, North America, and uh, Australia, and many from the Greek diaspora, which itself was divided. And then you had national liberation movements. We can't forget that this is a time of decolonization. And uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization was uh, particularly uh, helpful to us. Um, and then finally, what I would call clandestine resistance. And there, the most helpful was a Greek Trotskyist whose nom de guerre was Pablo. Uh, he and his wife had spent their whole lives in, in clandestinity. So all these fronts interacted uh, to try to get to the goal, which was restoring democracy uh, in Greece. Now our modest apartment in Geneva became a cross between a hotel and a railway station. And we would have uh, journalists, uh, torture victims, politicians, wannabe politicians, academics, and then volunteer couriers who were going back and forth uh, to Greece, fugitive revolutionaries, agents provocateurs, pizza delivery men, uh, you name it. Uh, what was different that most of those who came couldn't be seen by the other. So the doorbell would ring, we'd look to see who it was, the person in the living room said, you have to go to children's room number one, and then the person would come and then we'd keep rotating uh, this process. Uh, one time, two men from the resistance in Greece uh, showed up and they asked uh, Maria, listen, uh, we want explosives, we want detonators, we want timers. And Maria said, uh, sorry, we're very much against the junta, but we only are for legal, nonviolent means. So they left disappointed back to Greece. Then strictly by chance or accident, Maria was on a flight to Paris that afternoon, and those two guys were on the flight. They were working out of the Greek embassy in Paris. Um, so how we were involved in each of these things is uh, its much too much to cover. But according to the rules of public speaking, the speaker has to mention their mother. And my mother, who was a Republican, whatever, she became an absolute tireless campaigner for democracy in Greece. And so she spent a lot of time in Washington, long days, long corridors. She'd hand out leaflets. She'd talk to representatives. So what did she do? She wore roller skates. And she would go down these long corridors on roller skates. And an article appeared in the Washington Post which was grandmother skates for democracy. <laughs> so, okay. um, but what I think was to become the key issue, uh, of course, the human rights violation that had the most impact across all of these areas, uh, was the Junta's systematic practice of torture. 
Now that's the deliberate infliction of pain on another human being, either to extract information or punish them uh, or to uh, give the message to the rest of the population, which is a real dilemma for a government because they absolutely deny that they use torture. And on the other hand, they want everyone in the population to know that if they step out of line, they're going to be tortured. So, and, and the junta, of course, had that uh, dilemma. Uh, the first mention in the media about torture was the, in The Guardian by uh, Cedric Thornberry. And this led uh, Amnesty International to send two lawyers, Anthony Moreco and I, uh, to Greece to investigate these allegations. And we only had a few addresses. I mean, we just walked in there uh, cold. So in Athens, uh, for, we spent New Year's Eve in Athens, and we welcomed in Human Rights Year, which was 1968. So making uh, contact with the traumatized victims of torture was, of course, uh, very difficult in a society that was ruled by fear. And who was I, an American? That equals CIA agent. <laughs> so finally, a, a young woman agreed to meet and shaking, chain smoking, starting at end of the slightest news. Uh, she recounted her tortures at the Bubalinas police station. Then more victims agreed. Uh, same story, same traumatized human beings. The intensity of that experience for me is uh, something I've, I've never, uh, never forgotten. Uh, we returned to London. We wrote a report confirming that Greeks were being brutally tortured. We got coverage in the news. We appeared on television. Uh, it had an impact. And the junta denied it as communist propaganda, et cetera. But this was all part of the battle for public opinion. At the same time, a group of Scandinavians, who we just heard from, Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes, who were mainly jurists, were considering bringing a state-to-state -state case against the new dictatorial regime in Greece before the European Human Rights Commission. And, and clearly, there could not be a more flagrant case deserving of member states to bring an action. Um, now, previous cases that had an ethnic link, in fact, the first case uh, used was Greece using it about uh, about Cyprus. For these uh, Scandinavian jurists, it was simply a moral duty. Uh, there was no ethnic, no ethnic link, no commercial or territorial gain. Uh, little did they know the tremendous pressure they would come under uh, to abandon this uh, quixotic uh, venture. It's hard to imagine within Europe two different cultures. It's the north-south classic uh, divide. And uh, I don't know if any of them had ever been to Greece, uh, much less uh, speak, speak Greek. Uh, so who and what could they trust within this fractious Greek uh, exile community? Uh, so they were very much in the Nordic dark. So this is where Maria's story comes in. Uh, the, Mar the Maria who knew her Greeks. Um, so our life adopted a new rhythm. Maria would head off to the frozen north for a month to work with the team, uh, the one woman, uh, on their case. She'd come back, get caught up on what was uh, uh, happening, particularly the growing clandestine efforts, and then she'd go off for another month, so on and on. Uh, I was working on a book that became Barbarism in Greece and was firing off articles uh, left and right, mostly left, um, and uh, keeping in touch with anti-junta organizations. So there's no internet now, remember, so it's all about letters, which are now uh, archives. 
As the Strauss Borg hearings uh, were approaching, it became apparent the torture issue, if it could be proved, would carry the heaviest weight in favor of the Nordic case. Uh, so it was evident how important it would be for torture victims uh, to physically appear in Strasbourg to testify. There was no way the junta would allow them to travel, uh, and they were being, being watched. So now we're talking false passports. Not so easy. First, you need someone's passport, a uh, passport that would correspond a bit to the person who was trying to escape. Uh, and you need to get a recent photo of that person out of Greece. So that explains why couriers uh, were going uh, back and forth. And then you have to get it into the hands of a forger or a patriotic artist, however you look at it. <laughs> um, and then the doctored passport had to be taken to Greece and a safe contact made. So we produced many, many, many false passports, that's for sure. Um, and then they had to get through passport control, which is very nerve-wracking, and then uh, they ended up in our, our living room. Um, now, I, oh yeah, today I understand a passport can run 50,000 euros that would get you through the computer system. So then it was relatively easier. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't speak about a less appealing side of human nature and the human ego, especially when it comes to the desire for power. Uh, inevitably, there were splits in the exile community. And cutting to the chase, the most controversial character was Andreas Papandreou. Our initial enthusiasm soured as from the perspective of many he was not trustworthy and self-serving, a politician in the derogatory sense uh, who was a source of uh, division. He referred to Maria as that lady from, um, uh, whoops, and I'll, I'll remember that, um, Kolonaki. That lady from Kolonaki, okay. Uh, well, what, uh, okay, okay, what, single figure could unite the Greeks. Well, what about George Milonas? He was a centrist politician. He was a political prisoner on the island of Amargos. Anyway, his son-in-law, Elias Koulikundis, organized a very effective uh, escape. And the speedboat bringing Milonas was met in Bodrum, Turkey, by Henrik Lilligren, who was part of the Scandinavian team. <coughs> Uh, and uh, they went to Istanbul. He had a false passport. He was in our uh, apartment in Geneva before the police on the island even knew he was gone. And then within five minutes, we knew <laughs> this guy doesn't cut it. It just, no. <laughs> so um, that was a major disappointment, but at least the hunter was embarrassed. And also, they got a front page article in the uh, New York Times. Okay, so who is another candidate that could unite everybody? And uh, the next candidate willing to escape was General Kumanakos, who was the hero uh, uh, in the Korean War. So, uh, General sounded good. It sounded better than Colonel, so that was good. So. The, the government moved all their prisoners inland to the middle of the country in the mountains. They took them off the islands. So this was going to be a more expensive escape effort. And we teamed up with uh, a British television station, uh, World in Action. A cameraman tourist was sent to the mountain village, so it was all ready with a camera. And, um, a yacht with family vacationers, Maria and the daughters, uh, was off towards, sailed into Greek waters as the general would be rushing down and they would meet. All systems go. So then, at the very last minute, the courageous General Kumanakos uh, decides he doesn't want to go. So the yacht, with its 
drunken Danish, excuse me, <laughs> captain uh, ends up at night drifting in the Straits of Messina, which is full of tankers and cargo. My God, I got five minutes. Okay. Um, so all of this was leading towards Strasbourg. Five minutes. Okay. Um, Oh gosh, okay. Strasbourg, and I'm sure people will cover Markitaki's Meletis, uh, you know, they defected, etc. Okay, um, that was the best part. Okay, <laughs> the climax came a year later, year later after more hearings, uh, thousands of documents, when on December 12, 1969, Punta Greece faced com then nation and walked out of the Council of Europe. I remember standing at the head of the stairs with Maria as Pipi Nellis, the Junta foreign minister, had just walked out from the meeting room below us. Uh, as he passed, he hissed at Maria in Greek, this is all your fault. Who knows? But recently, as a filmmaker, I had the chance to interview some 60 people about Maria. Ole Esperson, who was part of the Danish team and became a Minister of Justice later, he said categorically, without Maria, we would not have won our case. Uh, she was someone who totally shunned any publicity. She was a behind-the-scenes uh, person. She was very courageous, even went into Greece with a blonde wig to collect affidavits. She was physically attacked outside our apartment. She was attacked in an airport in which she broke her arm. She also spent uh, 18 hours in a Syrian jail when she was at a PLO training camp. So the battle went on another five years. Okay, so I've got all these categories. So have human rights advanced? I'm appalled by my own country when the empire, always in need of an ism, uh, lost communism and they had to turn, they got the ism of terrorism and they openly advocated torture with the government lawyers calling it enhanced interrogation. And there never was any accountability for these uh, crimes. Okay, we're winding up. Here we go. Sadly, Maria's story does not have a happy ending. Starting in the 90s, she had organized eight environmental symposia under the auspices of the ecumenical patriarch uh, Bartholomew, where she put religious leaders and scientists together on a ship to discuss their mutual concern about the threatened environment. Along with them on this large ship were activists, the media, politicians, and they sailed around eight troubled bodies of water from the Amazon to the Arctic uh, to the Adriatic. These had a real impact. Bartholomew became the Green Patriarch. 30% of the financing came from the Greek Foreign Ministry because they wanted to help Bartholomew stay in Constantinople as the, as the Turks were trying to kick him out. Um, Maria was rapidly going through her personal fortune. A Papandreou prime minister declared a campaign against the corruption among the NGOs who were buying yachts and uh, mansions and one of the first person they after, went after was Maria. And they accused her of fraud and uh, money laundering, as well as my two daughters. Um, the police raided her apartment, carrying off uh, every piece of paper. Someone mentioned to the first prosecutor that Maria had been active against the junta. The prosecutor sniffed and said, everybody says that now. <laughs> the attacks in the press were merciless. The Becketts were shunned, crooked millionaires, and they were facing uh, prison terms. Finally, Maria had enough. She devoted her life to Greece, and uh, she drank the hemlock, not literally, but she that was it. So she did receive some good uh, obituaries in, in the foreign press. And the Guardian wrote, she brought more goodwill to Greece 
than any Greek in the last 50 years. Uh, so my five minutes. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, I, I must say that this is very moving that people care about this now. So I, I, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I thank you all for organizing.